Look, welcome everyone. Hopefully you're having a great uh, track here in the cloud security track. I'm Sandy Bird. I've been the CTO and one of the co-founders of Sunray Security for about four years now. And this is going to be a great session on stories and lessons learned. Um, when I started uh, Sunray Security, I really believed that, you know, least privilege in perfection in I'm going to call it public cloud, AWS, Azure, and GCP, where you've got your teams building workloads in cloud, <clears throat> was possible for the first time. I really thought since cloud actually logged everything because there was a bill associated with it and we could build these, you know, very granular policies down to the individual permission level, and we knew what all the permissions were and we knew where all the audit data was, we could actually do this kind of perfection statement of least privilege and we could achieve that probably for the first time ever. Um, but this is a bit of a story about lessons learned where maybe perfection isn't always achievable for several reasons, and maybe there's a better way to do things than what we were originally thinking. And so we'll spend a bit of time today kind of going through the, the basics. Everyone knows what least privilege is, but there's some, some things that are interesting about it when you get into cloud, which we'll talk about um, on the edges, which uh, people will find uh, interesting to hear probably. We'll talk about some issues that real customers have had actually trying to get there. So when you were trying to get to least privilege and said it was going to be perfect and you invested in the people, time and materials to do it and all of a sudden didn't get there, what were the failures in that and why did they happen? And then we'll spend a little bit of time on the why could we do this differently? How could we do this differently and how could we achieve? And this whole kind of talk comes from this interesting four years of history working with two sets of customers. One set of those customers being very mature, typically large financial companies, highly regulated, could afford the staff and the resources to make their cloud as close to perfect and as low risk as possible. And a different set of customers, which were my land, we need to rather build in cloud first, or we're going to just be move our massive sets of workloads from on-prem into cloud to save money. Maybe that was a, a dream that was going to happen. And the cloud infrastructure, the cloud security team at that level were generally understaffed. The team was being gold on getting more workloads out, not making them least privilege. And then the failures of trying to get to least privilege in that model. And so working in those two models, you have two very different groups. You have one group that has a huge team that can do great things. Um, they probably have multiple people just writing controls in the cloud. And then you have one which is clearly understaffed and relying on the development teams probably to do most of the work under the covers. So when you look at this least privilege in cloud, you would say, well, you know, we all know that we need to have least privilege. Why is that? Honestly, if there were no bad actors and you trusted everybody in your organization, you don't need least privilege. You give everybody star and it wouldn't matter. But that's not the reality of the situation. I talked to a customer uh, recently and they were saying how, you know, we spend all of our time, you know, patching vulnerabilities and making sure our, our stuff is clean from our, you know, audit reports. And when they looked at like the attacks over the last year, they discovered that, you know, most of them end up with somebody, you know, phishing, stealing, getting access to some highly privileged credential or a lower level credential and then escalating by grabbing stuff out of a, a password vault or whatever it is, and then using that credential. They literally are logging in and getting the data. They're not having to break through any walls to do that. And so you need scenarios for things like separation of duties. You need to understand how privilege escalation could happen. So if somebody gets access to a low level uh, identity, how they would privilege escalate. And so the simplest answer, of course, to this is just only give things exactly what they need and detect the edge boundaries for separations of duties where they shouldn't be there and, and you should be fine. You would get to least privilege. But there's this, you know, I use this third point on this, this dormant identities. And you say, well, any identity that is not used ever clearly if it has some form of an entitlement is not at least privilege. And uh, when we look at all of these kind of environments, we have environments that have, you know, thousands and thousands of cloud accounts in them. And then we have some which have 10 accounts in them. Every one of them, if they have been active in cloud for some period of time, three years, five years, has massive numbers of these identities that are left behind. Our, our sales engineers like to call them cyber litter. Um, just these things that are not used anymore that are there. And uh, this is where this problem starts to come in because you would say, well, the use easiest thing is to take all their privileges away and delete them, get rid of them. But people don't do that. And the question always is, you know, why don't they do that? 
we have lots of tools for doing it. You can look at the cloud providers today. You have IAM Access Analyzer in AWS. You have Entrez Permission Management. You have Policy Analyzer in GCP. We have lots of attributes in those clouds that give you the last time anything was used. You have products like Sunry Security, which has been in the CIEM space, cloud infrastructure entitlement management space for a long time. We can give you perfect policies. We can give you decent policies, which don't break everything in the console when you log in. Um, we can give you all these things. And yet no one can just go and do sometimes the most simplest thing of, of deleting these unused identities. And when you ask the customers why, it becomes really obvious as to what the problem is. You have a cloud infrastructure team that has, you know, maybe 50 teams underneath of them that are building applications. And they look at this identity that they want to clean up. And they're like, this thing has a bunch of entitlements attached to it. You know, in the case of Visual World, those are our back assignments. In the case of AWS, a bunch of policies. They may be used in trust relationships on resources. So you may have a bucket policy that then references that. If it's a identity that has an access key associated to it, so, you know, maybe it's one of those enterprise apps in Azure, or maybe it's a, um, a scenario or an app registration in Azure, or maybe it's a scenario in AWS where it's an IAM user. If you were just to delete that, and take it away, they wouldn't know how to put it back. And so if that's part of a really important process where all of these relationships exist and they delete the original identity and they delete the access key material and they delete the actual permissions that were there, none of the things line up. And if when that goes to you know be used again, they won't know what to do. And so they're almost, you know, hand high. They can't do it. Um, to actually, you know, go and delete these identities. And so what's interesting is we did some statistics across our customers and, and customers that have been in cloud for more than five years, 75% of the identities were unused in many of these customers. That's an average number we calculated. Some was worse than that. We said, well, if no one can actually even just delete the unused identities, what's the chances that they could actually get everything in their cloud to least privilege? And then all kinds of interesting things start to come into play, like the fact that if you have a sandbox account, you probably don't want it at least privilege. You want people to explore and innovate and do great things. But if you have a highly restricted production account, now actually you do want to get to least privilege. And so you have this kind of um, friction between those two areas and what you're going to do. So we took a real customer that was doing this. Um, this is actually one of those customers that can afford the time to do things right. And they they did a nice idea where they found some identities that they really wanted to get to least privilege in some really critical areas of their network. And they said, that's fine. We're going to select these. These are the ones that we're going to target. We're not going to target the 100,000 identities we have across the whole environment. Let's target these ones. Um, let's take those and we're going to make sure that we have some window of here's what they did so we can build this history backwards in time to figure out what that um, window is to put least privilege on them. Um, we're going to take those and we're going to send the, the perfect policies that are generated or the, the least privileged policies out to the teams. We're going to put them in JIRA. They're going to work these tickets. Just finding the teams that were responsible was complicated enough. It took a little bit of time. So there was some communication time and actually getting back and forth to the teams um, to make sure that the right team and the right ownership of that identity was there. Then the actual team, of course, had to do this. Often they were in things like, you know, Terraform. So they would have to update the Terraform. They would end up testing it in, you know, dev. And then, okay, it's good. Let's promote it to stage. And they succeeded, actually. They got them all into development. But to do the 2,000 identities took them 10 months. And during that 10 months, if you were to monitor, more than 10,000 new identities got created at the same time. So everything sort of got better, but didn't get better at the same time. And you realize that, as much as we can automate, hey, we can generate a least privileged policy, we can look back in time using IAM Access Analyzer, using the Sunray solution or whatever it is, and you can pick up that perfect policy and you can jam it on the identity, most teams won't accept that. They actually want to go through this process of saying, okay, well, we're going to test it first. We're going to make sure the thing that put that there is actually updated all those things, and that takes time. And so to do 2,000 identities, you know, maybe takes 10 months. How do you solve this problem when you have 100,000 identities? And the day you get it fixed, the next day there's you know 5,000 more. And so this actually got us to thinking, maybe we're not doing this right. As an industry, maybe we have broken the model that says getting to least privilege, as much as it's perfect for the purist like me four years ago saying we can do this, maybe it's not helping anybody because everybody just feels like they will never get there. Um, there's a, a great quote from an AWS architect. I just don't buy least privilege. It's not possible, right? And uh, in some ways, I think that's true. 
So look, we started to do this in a different way. We basically said, look, I know everybody wants to get to perfect least privilege, but let's stop doing that. And instead, let's actually take the time and look at all of these permissions that are in cloud. And if you look at AWS Azure and GCP, there's over 40,000 unique permissions there. Not all of those are that sensitive and need to be at least privileged. Some of those sensitive, uh, some of those permissions are just not that sensitive. And when you really look at it, there's about 2,500 to 3,000 permissions that if somebody that was a nefarious actor, a fun form or an insider that was acting against your company got a hold of, they could do some real damage. They could tear the cloud apart and destroy it ransom it they could you know poke a hole in the infrastructure and leak data out they could do all kinds of nefarious things think about creating internet gateways creating pre-signed urls changing the resource policy on something to open it up to the outside world these are the types of things that you don't want to have happen but most of the permissions are not that they are let's describe the DynamoDB tables, but not read the data in them, or let's um, get a listing of all of the policies that are in the account. But again, that in it itself isn't that sensitive. And most of the permissions are that way. And so what happens is, if you take these really sensitive permissions and you use some sort of a framework for it, we happen to use MITRE when we did it. So we kind of use the attack framework to say, which of these ones could lead to things like persistence in the account, or which of them could lead to um, you know, credential access, which of them could be used to exfil data. And so by using these kind of categories and going down through there and saying, okay, there are certain ones of these that are really important. Let's make sure that we protect those and make sure we get those to least privilege, but not worry about the other ones. Now, the initial gut reaction to this would be, okay, but I still have that whole developer time where I have to push a policy out to everybody and do that. And we said, that doesn't work. You can't do that. So we need to find a way to centralize this in a different way. And so we kind of turned this thing on its head. Instead of cloud infrastructure, cloud operations teams trying to coordinate with all these development teams to protect these very sensitive permissions and get them to update their work, let those teams do whatever they're doing. Don't try to fix the 10 month problem for 2000 identities. Don't try to create least privileged policies on every identity. Don't deal with that at all. For these 3000 most sensitive permissions, let's create one central deny policy that says across the entire cloud, we're not going to allow anything to create internet gateways anymore. Let's not allow anything to change those resource policies. Let's not allow anyone to use those 3,000 sensitive permissions. And so we deploy that centrally and create a global deny model. This isn't unfamiliar to people. If anyone's ever gone through things like, you know, setting up firewalls or, you know, whitelisting of applications or any of these processes, this is how that's done. But it does mean that in doing it, you need a way to give back the things when they're needed very quickly and with super low friction. And so in summary, we decided to build this in a model where we would take those 3,000 most sensitive permissions, we would create a default deny at the top of the cloud or whatever area you wanted to start in. You could start in one team if you wanted doing this in one team, or you could do it at the whole level. And by doing that, we could actually create this kind of deny first mentality, but with a really low friction way to give the individual teams that had the over-provisioned identities with EC2 star or contributor rights in Azure, but put a block in place if they tried to use one of these permissions. The same research that gave us that 75% of identities are unused in these long-lived clouds there is another statistic that came out of that is that when we looked at things that had access to those 3000 sensitive permissions, the really bad ones, so they had the ability to use create internet gateway, they had the ability to do these nasty things, 92% of them never, ever, ever used them. In the longest window, some of our customers have been with us for four years, 92% had never used those permissions, but they had access to them. So we kind of built this model that said, hey, there are four pillars of doing this. Let's restrict things very quickly at the top. If you have access to EC2 star, you're not going to be allowed to create an internet gateway. If you've never used it before, you're going to stay in that deny state. But the soon as you have used it, so we've seen history of you using it, we put you in exemption list, or you need it, there's a quick way to get out of that model. You basically remove that 92% of that overprivileged access in one shot. So instead of trying to update the 50,000 identities that have access to it, you simply write one policy and you're done. 
The second thing is those unused identities. So the ones that were hanging out, that cyber litter that was there. Instead of deleting them, which no one's willing to do, there's break glass accounts. You might screw that up. Oh, we don't know what that resource is. Maybe it's going to wake up in six months and do something. We can't put it back. That's okay. Let's just short circuit them. And all of the clouds have ways of doing this. It's different in every cloud, but there's always a way you can short circuit identity and make it not work without actually destroying the way that it's configured into your cloud. And the hope, of course, is, is after you've put it to sleep, you've quarantined the zombie for you know some period of time, you will be comfortable after two years saying, yeah, well, it probably really isn't used. We could actually get rid of that. And surely if it's your break glass accounts, you have a list of them somewhere so you can make exemptions for those, right? And so it allows you to get comfortable before doing that, but removes the risk. An attacker can't grab a hold of this thing and use it, uh, you know, whatever it is in that, that given state. Same thing exists in terms of services and regions. If you're not using services and regions, you should turn them off. They're just opening up areas for data to get moved and get lost in that you didn't know was there. They're just opening up services, which have a whole bunch more sensitive permissions, which you don't need in your company. But again, there are areas in those sandbox and innovation accounts you want to leave some of the stuff open to use, and that's okay. And so the way, the new way of, of doing this for most of my customers is what we call a cloud permissions firewall. And what it does is it builds the right exemptions on day one. So it goes back in history. It figures out what needs those sensitive permissions and it gives those things access to continue to use them. It doesn't break anything. But the day after it is deployed, you move into this permissions on demand model, which is, hey, if the Terraform role that's building a bunch of the infrastructure in this account accidentally tries to do something, not accidentally, intentionally tries to do something it's never done before. It tries to create a new internet gateway because that's part of the new workload it's rolling and it's never done that. It will trip that alarm. Immediately, the team will get a message in whatever they use for daily communications. This isn't a new JIRA ticket. This is a message that pops up in Slack, pops up in Teams, sends you an email and says, hey, the thing you just deployed broke. We broke it. We denied creating an internet gateway. Do you need to do it? Yes or no? Approve it. Put the approval in. Try it again. In one minute, the thing works. And so there's no more going and requesting permissions or trying to get to lease privilege or whatever. It's controlled centrally as it probably should have been from day one. And so it's a real different way of dealing with this. Now, I think there's an interesting way to actually show this. So I'm actually going to, we're going to see if this works here. I think it'll work great. We're going to pop over to this. I call this my speed dating uh, kind of demo through this. I'll take one or two minutes to do this. And then I'm just going to open it up for questions really quick. But what we've done is created an interface that allows you to see your entire cloud structure. So this is an example of AWS where we're looking at an organization. You can look at multiple accounts. You can look at a part of the OU, whatever you want. We'll detect the unused services, those unused identities. You can quickly go and preview um, what those unused services are. So if you're not using IoT Core and you're not using Macy, you can disable very quickly. We'll turn those off at whatever scope that is. Top of the OU, an OU structure, single account, doesn't matter. We will find those zombies. So if Maurice Moss hasn't been used for 91 days or Jen Barber hasn't been used for four months, let's actually go and remove those. You can quarantine them, shuts those identities off, but you can also wake them back up. So again, through that same chat ops scenario, you can basically create a, um, oh, it tried to wake up. Do you want to approve the wake up or not? Yes or no. And the same thing down to those things that are given privilege, Lambda star, EC2 star, you know, virtual machine contributor in Azure, all of these different entitlements that have really sensitive permissions in them that are often not used, you can simply protect those. You put them in the deny by default mode for those 3,000 most sensitive permissions. And if they need to wake back up, they instantly can wake back up just through one of those approval processes. No one's obviously going to do that. Um, you know, at the top of their cloud on day one instantly. You could get this done in a couple of days if you wanted to, but you want to test it somewhere small. So look, you can go into something like the EC2 uh, service, which you know is going to be used in places. You can basically go and see the 41 individual permissions that are going to be restricted. So we're going to start restricting things like address transfers and changing the route tables and grading internet gateways. Those are going to be denied by default. You can actually go in and see what those exemptions are, when they were last used. You can actually take and put an account that's not using EC2 service or whatever it is in, in a protect mode or a disabled mode. Probably not going to disable EC2, but in our demo accounts, you have these types of scenarios. What happens there is, though, you at that point get a piece of infrastructure as code. So we build up a set of you know pending changes. We're going to disable the service. Summary security, the third-party provider providing the solution, isn't actually 
making the changes in your cloud. What we're doing is we're building you a piece of infrastructure as code that you deploy in the cloud that puts these controls in place. And it's 100% cloud native. There's nothing like we're not putting a weird man in the middle gateway there that you have to go through. We're not doing anything weird with a session recorder. What we're doing is using cloud native controls. Think about things like SCPs and policies and things like that. We're dropping those in to put this state into your cloud where it is now denied by de default to all identities but putting those right exemptions that were in place, you can then go and actually submit this change, approve that. And what happens is, is now the cloud is in that, that state. And so here's an example where you're sitting here, you know, in front of an AWS console, you're trying to, you know, edit an inbound rule. You've never done this before. We've got sneaky Jeff here. Sneaky Jeff tries to save this rule and immediately gets denied. And so what happens here is, is that at that point, there's a request made to whatever you use for, you know, your communications. But basically, you know, the approver for this is Jeff. I'm going to be Jeff today. I'm logged in as Jeff. Um, Sneaky Jeff just tried to do one of these sensitive permissions. You can approve that permission, say why that's approved. And at this point, you can actually go back to um, that environment, run that scenario again, and actually have it be approved. And so it's that quick for getting this done. Now you're back at the same screen. You've got these inbound rules. You save your rule, and it works. And so it's very easy to kind of get through this scenario, rather it's coming in through Slack, rather it's coming through Teams, whatever that's coming through, to get the developers back to working within one minute of them running into one of these rules. And you can build those approvals so that they can be self-approval. Maybe it's a dev environment. They can pr approve their own sensitive permissions. That's fine. In production, you can use a tiered level of approval for a hierarchy to say somebody else has to approve it. And what's great about this is everyone's working in the development environment. You're building the manifest for what needs to be approved and prod as you go. So I'm going to actually stop sharing there. Um, you know, hopefully there maybe is a question or two. If there is, um, we can answer those. Um, and then, um, you know, we can we can have a chat. And if not, you'll have a few minutes to actually have a bio break between the uh, the two sessions. So I'm going to bring up. Hey, Sandy. Team. So, hey, hey, this is Dave. Um, hey, Dave. I do have some questions that uh, have actually come in. So, um, okay. yeah, let's 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 take them here. So, uh, so the first question, I think this is a pretty interesting one, asking basically how this concept of like permissions on demand differs from um, like just in time provisioning for rights. Is there sort of a, dis a distinction that you can make there? Yeah. And we actually get this question. Sometimes, you know, if people are familiar with just in time, it's typically focused more towards human identities. So you have this scenario where I need access to, you know, make a change in the middle of the night. I request access. Someone approves it. I go in with the most privileged user and I make my changes or I do the monitoring I need to do. And then I come out and the, the time box expires. Um, what's a little bit different with this permission on demand is, is that it leaves some set of permissions intact all the time. So the non-sensitive permissions are always there. Um, but when you trip while you're using the identity, it's the same identity, you're sitting there using that identity and you trip on one of these really sensitive permissions and it's denied that prompts that just in time flow. And you can still time box them just like you can a standard uh, just in time scenario, but it's only for those most sensitive permissions. It's not for the role itself to be logged in. So it's slightly different, solves kind of the same use case in the human side. One of the things that it does a little different though is it works for workload identities as well. So if you haven't, um, and this is kind of something that surprised me. We had a design partner where we were building this that said to us, um, we were kind of showing the flow and we showed an example in that where it was their build role or something was doing something and it deploys in the middle of the night. So when it was tripping, it was tripping at that point in time. He says, it's actually interesting. We only do deploys between, you know, whatever it was, Friday night at 10 p.m. and, you know, Sunday morning at whatever. We really only want to open that role up for that period of time. We don't want to open it up all the time. So it gives you the ability to do just in time for non-people identities too, um, if that's an appropriate thing to do in your organization. So um, it's similar, but yet a little bit different too. So 